Greetings, friends at Cyber Initiative Tokyo. I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of social innovation. I'm really happy to be here virtually to share with you some thoughts around digital transformation based on the questions that I have received. In the face of new lifestyles and other social changes, what did you as a minister consider necessary and what measures did you take? What measures have already been effective and what measures have not been as effective as expected? And what measures are likely to be effective in the future? Well, I believe, as the name of the conference shows, taking initiative is the most important. And that means that each and every citizen need to be empowered with not just the digital access, like broadband as a human right, but also the know-how, the competence, not just literacy, of how to remix and reuse digital technologies and components. For example, as you know, last February, we began the mask rationing program. But it is the civic technologists in the GovZero G0V community that came up with this brilliant idea of visualizing the real-time inventory of all the pharmacies' real-time stock of masks so that people do not have to queue in vain. But this is not a relationship of procurement, but rather reverse procurement. The specification, the norm, was set by the people, the social sector, and we just provided from the state the real-time open API, updated every 30 seconds as people queue in line. So this means that the innovation is open, and people who are not that used to interactive maps has the, exactly the same numbers and know-how to create, for example, interactive chatbots or voice assistance for people with seeing difficulties and so on. And this proved to be very effective as more than 100 different applications started in the first seven days of the mask rationing program, which resulted in the three quarter of our population getting access and wearing masks in a record time, and so that makes sure that our early counter-pandemic efforts last year was very, very successful and the R value was controlled to be below one. Now, as for what measures uh, were not as effective as expected, well, the top-down measures. So any sort of centralized planning we have discovered uh, tend to disagree with reality. When we ration out masks, uh, we initially allocated the distribution of masks corresponding to the population distribution. That is to say, the pharmacy's availability, if you put it on a map, is almost exactly overlapping with the population centers. And our initial idea was that each average citizen should enjoy exactly the same physical distance uh, to a nearby mask that's available and that's most fair. However, soon the OpenStreetMap community discovered it was not the case because not everyone owned a helicopter and the distance on the map does not translate to the time, the opportunity cost that a person needs to access the nearby pharmacy. Maybe they have wait for um, an hour or so uh, for a bus in the more rural areas, whereas in the more urban areas with metro, well, it's much more accessible. And so because of this, um, they reanalyzed the real-time open API, and through a parliamentary interpolation, MP Engao <coughs> said to our Minister of Health and Welfare, uh, Minister, I don't think the distribution was fair. I have uh, the numbers to prove it. And Minister Chen simply said, legislator, teach us. For it was because of the radical transparency, the real-time availability of API, the numbers collected by machines and published upon collection that enabled a co-creative mood, not just demonstration as opposition, but demonstration as demo. So the very next day after the interpolation, we implemented a much more fair rationing scheme along with pre-registration, pre-ordering, and so on. So these people, public, private partnerships are the kind of measures, the model that are likely to be very effective in the future. The next question is, 
Responding to COVID-19, Taiwan used the power of civic tech to develop the app, the system that notifies pharmacy of mask inventory in a short period of time. What are some of the points that you pay attention to in terms of information security in order to make effective use of civic tech? That's a great question. You see, in Taiwan, the National Health Insurance Administration enjoys its own private network, not connected to any internet services that hosts the centralized database of all the transactions for the insurance records and so on. And since 2003, when SARS first hit Taiwan, we very quickly learned that all the not just hospitals, but clinics, pharmacies, and so on, need to connect to this virtual private network system in order to make sure that the info security is not just protected on the edge, but also protected by the network topology. So basically, the idea is very simple. On the cybersecurity layer, we ensure that there is mutual accountability. Whenever any transaction happens, there is a record of a particular pharmacy or clinic having this transaction with the national health card that a citizen takes with them. And so when they purchase a mask using the national health card, it's not just used for rationing purposes, but also for auditing and accountability purposes. And that may sure that each and every pharmacist, clinicians and hospitals and so on can benefit from this um, penetration tested, this defense in-depth design that powers our existing national health care system. Compare that to any system that's invented during the pandemic, and you will find that people do not trust new data collection points that's invented amidst a crisis because people did not have sufficient um, experience with its cybersecurity as well as its privacy boundaries. And so, because Taiwan never declared a state of emergency, we basically hold ourselves to account to only use the existing measures, existing technologies before the pandemic and repurpose them for pandemic control. And that has the dual purpose of ensuring the resilience and reliability, but also to ensure the understandability, the explainability that is at the core of participatory auditing and accountability when it comes to cybersecurity systems. The next question asks, when governments and companies work on digital transformation, there are only a limited number of people who are familiar with digital tech, and there is a risk of high cost due to lock-in when relying entirely on IT vendors. What are your measures and solutions to overcome the lack of talent in your organization? As I mentioned, the open API approach made sure that people who innovate on the front end using chatbots, augmented reality, um, whatever, mobile websites and so on, uh, all these can benefit from the bedrock of the cybersecurity uh, measures that we have put in place by the larger system integrators. But they are not in a competitive relationship because basically when procuring uh, government systems, we can tick a box and say, um, whatever you make available for human beings, you must also make available using the Linux Foundation Open API standard to make it available to the robots. Otherwise, if a vendor does not implement universal access in terms of catering to people with seeing difficulties, of course, they could be disqualified for discrimination. And using the same contract language, if they do not comply to open API at a negligible cost, uh, in addition to the cost to make such systems, then they could also be disqualified for discriminating against robots. Well, we don't quite say that, but that's the effect. And so because of that, the open API is the angle upon which that the startup ecosystem, that the civic tech ecosystem can build alternate ways of experiences of interacting with people. But as I mentioned, the underlying infrastructure remains secure. And so this enables us to tap into the talent of the entire society, not constrained by one or two IT vendors. The next question asks, even in a democracy, there is a clear risk that fake news will spread social division. 
What can the executive branch and media companies do to prevent social media mediated social fragmentation? Well, in Taiwan, the media companies that covered, for example, our presidential election, worked with the schools, like a middle school,、uh, when the students can fact check. The presidential candidates, as they are doing their debates and forums, to type the transcript, to check it against the sources, and if they find any discrepancies, it's not just an exercise; rather,、uh, it gets posted on the live stream on the media channel on public television, and so on. And so that ensures that the lifelong and basic education of media competence is not just about literacy, about understanding the news, but rather about making the news. And as for the administration, I think we need to invest in a digital equivalent of the public infrastructures, like a university campus or a public park.、Uh, essentially, the online spaces where people can have a pro-social conversation about policies. In Taiwan, the academic network hosts the PTT, which for 25 years has been free of advertisers and shareholders, and yet is one of the most active. Forums for public issue deliberation. That's the place、uh, when the Dr. Li Wenliang's message from Wuhan of the seven SARS cases、uh, in December 2019 spread to Taiwan, and within just 24 hours, the people triaged the message, contributing to a pro-social investigation, which resulted in we getting、uh, the advance warnings and、uh, public inspections. Of the health of the flight passengers coming in from Wuhan on the very first day of 2020, so that's collective intelligence. And we also invested in the Join platform, which is a one-stop platform、uh, with more than 30 million visits、uh, in Taiwan. 23 million people—it's a lot—and、uh, participatory budgeting, regulatory pre-announcements,、um, the、um, accounting of the national budgets,、uh, and the citizens' initiatives with 5,000 people. Post petitions.、Um, every、um, two weeks, we meet face to face with the people who raise those issues and hold collaborative meetings in an interagency fashion, and so on. Of course, all of this takes investment, which is why in 2016 we classified、uh, those budgets as infrastructure budget, even though it's not made from concrete, like not concrete,、uh, tangible construction. But nevertheless, we understood if we do not have the digital equivalent. Of the town halls and public squares, then our citizens will be forced to deliberate about policy、uh, in the digital equivalent of a nightclub, right? With a smoke-filled room, you have to shout to get heard. Addictive drinks,、uh, private bouncers, and so on, namely Facebook.、Uh, and I don't have anything against the entertainment sector. I mean, the nightclubs in Taipei uh, is open uh, now, but、um, I don't think、uh, that these districts it should be the place、uh, that we hold our town hall and deliver. Collaborative democracy、um, events in. So、um, people would like to know: in Japan, anonymous slander and fake news have become a problem in the SNS space. What is the situation in Taiwan? And also, what are your thoughts on this issue? Of course, in Taiwan, we do have disinformation, and we do have the sort of information manipulation, as I mentioned, that try to interfere with the election integrity and so on on the social media. And、uh, it come to a really high、uh, degree of intervention in 2018.、Uh, but for the 2020 election, we have witnessed less influence of such campaigns on the democratic process. And the reason why is that in 2019 there was a concerted efforts. By the social sector, by the professional journalists, and so on, to start a norm package. That is to say, what is considered normal for those social media companies to do. For example,、uh, the social sector G Zero V Gov Zero people a few years ago、uh, literally occupied, well, went into the national、uh, accounting office, the Control Yuan, and brought out the paper copies. At the time, there were no digital、um, downloads, so just paper copies of the campaign. Donation expense records uh, and um, digitalization was done、uh, through the participatory.、Um, 
optical character recognition so that the investigative journalists have the access uh, for the first time of the structural data of the past elections. And of course, uh, the control yuan uh, eventually changed the rules, the law, so that uh, you don't have to download uh, through paper OCR anymore, uh, but rather it's published as open data. Now, in 2019, the social sector applied the same pressure to Facebook, saying that the uh, foreign-sponsored political and social advertisements needs to be banned because we also ban such foreign-sponsored campaign donations. And also, even if it's domestic source, uh, exactly who provided which target um, of the messages uh, to how many people, uh, all this needs to be radically transparent in a open data way. And Facebook basically were faced with the implicit threat of social sanction if they do not conform to the norm that is set by the people and the public sector has already adhered to. And so that is why in the 2020 presidential election, the situation is much better and our democratic process uh, were not uh, in that much of a danger uh, from the algorithmic sponsored uh, interventions. The next question asks, the COVID-19 pandemic has drastically changed the way we do business and live, including telework. How do you see the security risks changing before and after the corona disaster? Well, in Taiwan, uh, we've never had a lockdown in the past couple of years. And so people are by and large not forced to telework. Um, of course, I'm a teleworking minister. I've been teleworking since 2008 and as a public servant uh, since 2016. So uh, sharing some personal experience, I guess, of teleworking uh, instead of this societal thing because we've never had a lockdown uh, is in order. So uh, in my opinion, the teleworking uh, in the places where it's not a satellite office, but rather a cafe or at home and so on, brings a very different threat model, a very different configuration. Nowadays, of course, we've seen that a more proactive way of intrusion detection uh, or the uh, so-called uh, zero trust configuration of network of the privacy and cybersecurity at the edge and so on are, are now becoming necessary because of the teleworking configuration. But I would also like to say that a, a good habit like wearing masks and washing hands and social distancing, that sort of good habits is also essential uh, when it comes to the enforcing uh, the cybersecurity rules, uh, but when people are literally in all the different spaces. So for example, uh, if a company or a large organization adopts teleworking, it, it pays to make sure that the individual workers understand the difference between their personal desktop and uh, work environment or a dedicated virtualized machine through remote desktop uh, or some other virtualization ways. The distinction between a browser that's running locally and a browser that's running in a security isolated environment and just streams uh, the images uh, to a desktop and so on. And there need to be a clear delineation of when to use which kind of tools, and just as uh, that when we're in the office, uh, we make a distinction uh, between the bring your own devices vis-a-vis uh, -vis the internal configuration of the intranet, we also need to make a similar distinction, but in our minds, uh, when we're passing through uh, the barrier. And previously, uh, it was on the network layer, so once you start using VPN, uh, you're in the intranet, but nowadays, I think uh, the entire configuration of the way we collaborate, the tools that we use to video conference and so on, need uh, always to reflect uh, this reality uh, to make sure that when people get into a working environment, this working environment adheres uh, to the privacy and cybersecurity rules and norms in the workplace, but instead of uh, in the kind of outside environment of their own devices. So habits and norm building, I believe that are the most important ideas in a teleworking environment. Uh, the next question asks, Advanced technologies such as AI and quantum technologies can contribute to improving cybersecurity, but they can also be a weapon, of course, for attackers. How should governments and businesses deal with the duality of the advanced technologies? That's a great question. So I believe that the best protection 
against the emerging threats of emerging technologies is widespread social competence. When the entire society understand how to doctor photos, right? How to Photoshop,、uh, then they become resilient against the、um, shallow fakes, right? That that uh, would uh, make anonymous slanders and scam and spam and phishing and so on effective, right? So the idea is that if each and every one person become competent. In the use of AI as assistive technologies, that people are comfortable of understanding、uh, the models and demanding、uh, accountability and extensibility and so on in the front line, then、uh, we're not trapped、uh, in a situation where only a few percent of the elite、uh, controls the rules、uh, that governs the AI or the use of quantum and so on. And the social innovators will then be able to not just hold the technologists. To account, but also, as I mentioned, demonstrate actively by demoing a better way to adapt、uh, to the actual situation in their society, and therefore, this resilience is、um, enforced by the people closest to the front lines, and instead of、uh, having a one top-down way of regulating、uh, against all the. Potential、uh, threats, right? So instead of the single system that's robust, we need to have distributed, decentralized、uh, social and computational systems that is resilient. That is to say, of course, there will be threats, but just like、uh, building the、um, uh, materials that can absorb the initial earthquake and then、uh, be resilient. That is to say,、uh, after earthquake, very quickly、uh, recover from it. We need to build similar systems when it comes、uh, to. To defending against the emerging、uh, threats and uses of the digital technologies. The next question asks: When promoting social innovation through digital technology, what are the issues that need to be taken into account in terms of privacy protection? For example, personal data. And what measures should be taken? Please tell us separately for the government and for the private sector. Well, gladly. So for the government, I believe the point here is to trust the citizens. That is to say, if the citizens trust each other, and would like to store data in a place that's closer to the point they trust, the government should not forcibly centralize that data, but should instead invest in privacy-enhancing technologies such as federated learning, homomorphic encryption. Differential privacy and so on, that enables the data storage to not overextend or squander the trust because trust is not transitive, right? If a person trusts a data collector and the data collector trusts a data processor, it doesn't mean that the data subject automatically trusts the data processor. But if we apply Homomorphic encryption or other PETs, then such trust is not necessary because data processor process a encrypted version of the data and do not、uh, need to extend their、uh, purview to the raw data that it has privacy implications. So. Just like、uh, the building materials that I just referred to, those PETs needs to be a part of the basic vocabulary of all in the public service. Also, the National Center for High Speed Computation investigates how to speed up such computations and so on. And we've made strides and breakthroughs in applying post-quantum cryptography in the field of homomorphic encryption, so that we can use such techniques at ease, even. With the data that is previously too large to process this way, now the private sector, of course,、um, are the places where certain customers trust.、Uh, but if people don't trust this private sector processor, of course, they have competition, so、uh, they can go to some other places. So basically, just like the idea of social responsibility of uh, not. Um, contributing to carbon emissions, right? So the privacy violations can be thought of as a kind of emission、uh, that externalizes the negative externality to the entire society. Instead, we need to externalize the good. 
right? The best practices that you have invested in. Well, you can share the norms, if not、uh, the actual source code,、uh, with everyone in your industry, so that people understand the kind of PETs to use. And this not only builds a better branding, but actually makes the total trust to the kind of digital delivery of your goods and services much higher. Otherwise, people do not have a incentive to digitally transform their spending habits and their transaction habits. So basically, instead of asking for absolute trust, invest in infrastructures that can make yourself and your businesses trustworthy. The next question was about. What should companies and countries do to improve IT literacy, and what approach would be the shortcut? Well, IT connects machines,、uh, but digital connects people. So literacy、uh, is not sufficient. When we talk about literacy, it's about consuming information. That was、uh, like in the era of radio and television. But nowadays, with a smartphone, each and every person is media, and so they need to be competent. In the way that media works, that is to say, journalism, as I mentioned before, as well as the use of data for public good, how to join a data collaborative, and so on. But of course, such ideas, data bias, data stewardship, are kind of abstract and very difficult to teach, very time-consuming to teach. <clears throat> so the shortcut will be essentially deploying the kind of high-impact.、Um, Sources of data like air boxes in Taiwan's primary school.、Uh, most of the primary schools in Taiwan have air boxes that measures PM two point five and other、uh, climate and weather related、uh, environmental sensing、uh, numbers, and then contribute it to a distributed ledger maintained by our national academy. And so the students previously. Uh, could not easily comprehend the idea of a data bias or how to steward the data, but once they understand that the air box that they collaboratively maintain、uh, would actually inform their friends and family's choices before they go to jog,、uh, they would check the air pollution map、uh, and ensure that、uh, they only go out when it's safe to go out. Even large demonstrations、uh, to change our、um, energy and other public privacies are the direct result of the collective environmental sensing of more than ten thousand、uh, different places、uh, of such air boxes deployed. And so, this idea of competence is very easily、um, making an impact to their community, and therefore, the incentive for the individual students to contribute and to learn more about data science and so on、uh, becomes. Very very high because they understand they can help the livelihood, the health, the public health of the communities involved. So the shortcut is to connect data collection, analysis, and application to something that has a high social and environmental impact. Capstone projects fosters competence instead of just literacy, and I call this PBL, purpose based learning, because purpose leads to projects. Which leads to problems, and then the skill and mindset to overcome those problems together. So the next question is about what kind of IT literacy is necessary for a digital society. What about information security in particular? Please share your thoughts on both companies and individuals. So as I mentioned,、uh, in companies, it pays to make sure that we work together. In a way that is both swift, effective, and safe—that's to say, secure—and we need to begin by empowering the individual to make conscious choices on multi-factor authentication, on using,、um, you know,、uh, privacy tabs instead of downloading the video conferencing software, of choosing、uh, the routing and service providers that is cybersecurity minded. Uh, as well as making sure that there's always resilience, so、uh, three backups in at least two different physical spaces, and so on. And all these are something that a person can do as an individual 
So instead of the company enforcing one particular set of rules without explaining this, that would be like a lockdown fatigue, right? People would not know the why of policy making, but rather a set of easily understood norms and spread across the individuals and citizens. That I believe is the fundamental、uh, societal infrastructure for good cybersecurity habits. The next question asks: On the one hand, digital technology has positive aspects that enrich people's lives, but on the other hand, it can also be used for purposes such as surveillance and regulation, as in the PRC regime. So, what are your thoughts on this point? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, it all depends on the shape of power. When I talk about transparency, it's about making the state. Transparent to the citizens, so power at the edge, empowering the people's power. But in the PRC, when they talk about transparency, it's、uh, making the people transparent to the state. So that the word may be the same, but the direction entirely different. When I talk about AI, it's always about assistive intelligence. That, for example, like this eyeglass that aligns with my eyesight. But it doesn't display like a pop-up propaganda or advertisement that I have to, you know, wait for ten seconds to close. And if it breaks, well, I know exactly how it works. I can repair it myself, or I can bring it down the street for someone else to repair it. But I don't have to spend years to reverse engineer、uh, its inner workings. Nor should I pay ten thousand U.S. dollars、uh, in terms of the license fee, right? So the point is that it's a assistive technology because it empowers. My own dignity as a person, it connects me to other persons rather more easily, but it does not replace any individual. And so that is the assistive paradigm of assistive intelligence that always assists and augments the collective and connective intelligence of human beings. But if we get all the powers centralized in one or two single spaces. Well, then that will become a authoritarian intelligence, and so my thought is very simple. Basically, we need to concentrate on investing in the commons that empower not just the young people but also the senior people、uh, who have a different way of interacting with the system and enable them to contribute. So it's not just about machine learning; it is about collaborative learning, and I believe the spirit of collaborative. Of learning is the most important in democratic societies. So we can not just defend, but also advance、um, our cultures and our virtues as democratic polities. Well, I guess we're at time.、Uh, thank you for the great questions. Sorry, I didn't have the time to go through them all.、Mm, however, I would like to conclude by quoting my own job description. Which talks about collaborative learning, but also about how to transform from IT-based mindset to a mindset based on digital transformation.、It、goes like this: When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about Human experience, and whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. Live long and prosper.